Dr. Rousseau, thank you for participating in our series for patients and families. Today's topic is pituitary tumor, something most of us know very little about. Who gets a pituitary tumor? Well, the interesting thing about it is that they are very common. In fact, studies show that the, uh, between 16 and 20 percent of the population have pituitary tumors. They can affect men as well as women, children as well as adults, although because adulthood is so much longer, it tends to be more the adult population that are affected by these. And how are these tumors discovered? Well, the, they can be discovered by visual loss, by over or under production of pituitary hormones, or by headache, or some combination of those three. I see. Do we know what causes them? Well, I could tell you a lot about lab research and what we think causes them. We do know that it tends to be one cell gone awry, but the fact of the matter is we don't know enough about what sends that one cell off in another direction to be able to prevent them. And some pituitary tumors, you said, produce excess hormones. Can you say more about that? Sure. The most common of the overproducing or secreting tumors, as we call them, are the prolactinomas. These are tumors that produce or deliver excess prolactin, and that's the hormone that is used to maintain normal lactation at, during and after pregnancy. The second most common would be uh, those tumors that cause overproduction of growth hormone, and then the next most common after that would be those that cause Cushing's disease, which is an overproduction in the adrenal glands of too much cortisone. Those patients can be very ill. They look and feel as if they've been on too much steroid for too long. So how is the actual diagnosis made to confirm the presence of a pituitary tumor? Well, what you want to do is, is look in all those ways that you can to see if a mass in the pituitary gland is either disturbing the adjacent structure, such as the optic nerves, or if it's producing too much or too little of, of the hormones that the pituitary gland should be producing. So we always do a visual field study to be certain that this tumor isn't causing visual loss. In order to evaluate for those hormone producing tumors that we were just talking about, uh, biochemical markers are sought. So this is a matter of doing blood tests, sometimes augmented by urine tests or tests of the saliva or other more extensive endocrine markers. An MRI, of course, is a very important thing in order to be sure that one knows exactly where the lesion is and what its extent is. You've noted that there are a number of types of pituitary tumors. Could you please describe um, the ones that are most commonly seen? Sure. The most common are probably those that don't produce any excess hormone at all. They exert their effects by the pressure of growing up toward the brain, toward the optic nerves and surrounding structures. So there, one of the most important things would be to do a visual field test to be certain that the vision hasn't been lost or threatened. The next most common of the hormone producing tumors would be the prolactinomas. Now prolactin is the normal hormone that supports lactation during and after pregnancy. But in the patient who is not pregnant, it causes something called the galactorrhea amenorrhea syndrome, where a patient will both produce a breast discharge that's a milky discharge and also not have periods, as if they're pregnant, but they're not. The next most common would be the, those tumors that are caused by excess growth hormone production. In children, this causes giantism. In the adult whose long bones and their growth plates have closed, then this excess growth hormone production can result in bone being deposited along the jaw, the forehead, big soft tissue uh, deposition in the nose, tongue, and mouth. Even patients can have large hands and feet. In addition, there are those tumors that produce excess adrenocorticotrophic hormone or ACTH producing tumors. These exert their effect on the cortex of the adrenal gland and produce too much cortisone. These patients end up looking and feeling like they've taken too much steroid. How do the treatments for these tumor types differ? Well, the first treatment it can be something as simple as surveillance. Sometimes these tumors, in fact often, they're discovered on an MRI done for some other reason. So evaluating the small tumor with an MRI, hormone function and vision is probably all that needs to be done and this should be repeated periodically. Those patients may never need any treatment other than surveillance. 
But if the tumor is large at its initial presentation, or if it grows during surveillance, then some type of treatment should be done. Now in the case of prolactin producing tumors, these patients can be treated with medical therapy alone in almost every case. Quite often it's a matter of, a, of taking a pill or two pills a week indefinitely, but that should be sufficient to take care of their uh, problem and cause that tumor to stay under control. But there are those tumors, the growth hormone producing tumors, the adrenocorticotrophic producing tumors, or ACTH, those generally require surgery as the first treatment of choice. And if a patient does need surgery for their tumor, what can he or she expect? Well, let's take a look at this model. Most of the time, we're able to treat pituitary tumors with transsphenoidal surgery. Transsphenoid refers to going through the nostril in this direction toward the sphenoid sinus. Now, once that bone at the base of the skull and in the sphenoid sinus is opened, then one has access to the whole area of the pituitary gland, which is right here. This normally pea-sized and shaped gland sits right underneath the optic nerves. And this is the area where the tumor has grown. And as you can see, um, growth of a tumor in this location could cause trouble with vision. And if a transphenoidal approach is not indicated, I understand that a craniotomy might be. Well, that's right. In rare instances in which a pituitary tumor has become very, very large before it's been diagnosed, then it may be necessary to remove part of this bone and actually come through the skull rather than through the nose in order to get the tumor out. Now, are pituitary tumors likely to recur after surgical intervention? Well, they can. Although these are benign tumors, they tend to be quite difficult to remove completely, particularly when they've achieved a fairly large size at the time they're first discovered. Under those circumstances, in what we call macroadenomas, tumors that are larger than a centimeter in size or greater, those tumors tend to recur at the rate of about 10 to 20 percent over the first 10 years after surgical treatment. Mm. Are pituitary tumors likely to spread to other parts of the body? No, they're not. They're virtually always benign, so metastasis is really not a consideration in most cases. Well, how are pituitary tumor patients followed after surgery or after intervention? Well, this will vary a little bit from surgeon to surgeon. In our practice, we see patients after surgery at one month, three months, six months, a year, every year for five years, and every two years thereafter. Those are the routine visits, and then if there are any questions or problems that arise, they're seen, of course, more often than that. What types of physicians and other practitioners are they likely to see? Well, this is really a team uh, problem, and it requires a team to deal with it. The patient, of course, is the, the head of that team. The surgeon is involved. In addition to the neurosurgeon, there may be another surgeon, an otolaryngologist, commonly known as an ENT surgeon, who may assist with the surgical approach. There's also an endocrinologist, a psychologist, the physician who treats the patient normally, either their general practitioner or internist, are also very important. What are some of the issues that patients or family need to be aware of in managing pituitary disease over time? Well, I think it's important for patients to monitor themselves for recurrent symptoms. And it's also important to be involved in the surveillance program that's recommended by their neurosurgeon. Do you have any final thoughts or suggestions you'd like to impart to patients or families who are dealing with pituitary disease? Yes, I do. I think it's important for patients to feel that they can and should be active participants in their own care. These tend to be diseases that can affect mood and emotion, so they should have access to support. That's important as well. There's an entire team of doctors and other healthcare professionals who are there to help them, and I want them to know that. And then finally, there are groups that have websites available and other sources of information to refer back to if questions arise. I believe some of these will be listed at the end of the video. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Rousseau, for this informative presentation. Thank you for having me.